Hello, welcome to our Wednesday Bible Study Podcast. This is, we're broadcasting on the 3rd of July. Um, and so tomorrow, of course, is uh, Independence Day. And so I'm glad I wanted to go ahead and try to do this Bible study before the holiday. And everybody, uh, of course, myself included, will be taken off and um, trying to have a day off with family. And uh, so that's good, but it's also good to study God's Word. And so whenever you listen to this, you may, probably a lot of you will be listening to it after the holiday, and that's okay too. But uh, for those who listen either live or the day of, I um, wanted to make sure to be able to have this in today. We're going to uh, jump right in, um, entitled this uh, podcast, Trading Places, and uh uh, that said, uh, we're going to read from Genesis chapter 25th, 25. You'll soon figure out why I call it Trading Places. Chapter 25, verse beginning in verse 27. When the boys grew up, the boys are Esau and Jacob, the twins. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red. But Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am about to die, so what use then is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, First, swear to me. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So um, I uh, personally relate to this story. <laughs> Uh, for a personal reason, kind of a humorous th situation. When I was a, a kid, probably, I don't know how old I was, 8 to 10 years old. Well, no, probably a little bit older than that, maybe 10 to 12. Um, and my sister, uh, Rachel, my youngest sister, was eating. She had got some Reese's peanut butter cups, evidently. I don't remember from where or when, but I remember we were in the car, and she was eating them, and I... Um, had some uh, Star Wars figures. I was a big Star Wars guy. And uh, so I had all these action figures. And I asked my sister Rachel uh, if she would give me uh, a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Maybe it was her only one. I don't remember that. But anyway, she said, well, if I'll trade you uh, your Yoda action figure for it. And uh, I was, you know, looking at that Reese's Peanut Butter Cup overcome. And I said, okay, I'll trade you the... Yoda action figure for it. And I remember my dad saying, Marty, don't trade your birthright for a bowl of soup. And uh, it hit me that I was being like Esau. But I still traded that uh, Yoda action figure um, for a bowl of soup. Now, um, I will say uh, that it's kind of been a little bit of a... It stuck with me all these years, for sure, my dad saying that. But it's been a little bit of a joke once in a while between my sister and I and a couple of years ago we met at Christmas time and she gave me a special Christmas gift if you're watching live you can see this little Yoda it's not the actual Yoda action figure from back then but she gave it to me as a joke so I have have the Yoda action figure back uh, not that it you know I don't think it actually uh, bothered me too much all, the, all those days uh, truth be told when I was older and away at college, my mom sold in a garage sale all my action figures. So, um, you know, they're today probably worth some money. But anyway, that just is one of those things that happens probably to all of us. Uh, uh, but um, it kind of had a personal uh, connection to this story, um, albeit not as dramatic for sure uh, as selling your birthright. Uh, but just remember my dad say that. And there is some wisdom in what he said to say, uh, you know, and uh, so we're going to dive into the wisdom of this, the wisdom we can glean from this account of Esau and Jacob, uh, and it really kind of encapsulates their 
relationship in one in a few brief verses one uh, on account of their life together but the first thing i think the first wisdom we can glean from this is to not let your appetite control you uh, the bible in the new testament calls it the lust of the flesh and that appetite can be more than just food it can be a sexual appetite an appetite for alcohol for drugs for nicotine even an appetite for adrenaline rushes uh, people get from from winning you get a an endorphin uh, boost an adrenaline rush from winning um, or doing dangerous things like speeding or gambling even the rush you can get from receiving recognition and that you might say well that's pride pride of life the bible talks about the sins pride of life and uh, the lust of the flesh uh, you know and they are go together for sure but your physical body the lust of the flesh does get something like a chemical rush or a hormonal rush when you are praised and that can be an appetite that people have and want that all the time as well and are willing to do just about anything to satisfy that appetite and that's where we need to have wisdom um, God, in a way god gave us appetites of sort to remind us of certain things in life uh, you, if you didn't have an appetite, you might starve to death. Um, and, uh, you know, you need, we eat uh, to stay alive, so to speak, and to have energy to do things. And so the appetite reminds us how we need to eat. Um, even a sexual appetite ensures the hu that the human race continues on. You know, it, it has ensured the, the procreation takes place. Even that little endorphin rush you get from maybe receiving praise uh, you know dogs are like this and they'll do they'll want you to say good boy good boy or good girl good girl um, and so they'll do the right thing so there's a little bit of that that is from God but uh, like so many things that are out there that God maybe has given Satan twists and yes even humans can turn in something that is natural and then we can become slaves to these appetites and that's what happened to Esau uh, being hungry after hunting all day was a natural thing. Of course he was hungry. Uh, but being willing to trade his birthright as the firstborn for a meal to satisfy that hunger, well, he let his appetite override his thinking. Uh, really, we all as humans end up letting some sort of natural pull or chemical reaction in our brain sometimes overrule what we know is the right thing to do. That's probably happened to everybody in their life at some point or another, probably more than once. Uh, so there's wisdom, there's caution in, in this account of, of doing that. You know, you don't want to let that happen a lot of times or in big, big situations. Um, uh, there's so many things in life that do release these kind of positive hormones into our body. And then over time, they become the ones that rule over us instead of us being master over them. Uh, so this gaining control over appetites is really something we need to see the Holy Spirit empower uh, us with. In other words, we'll never become a master over these poles and these appetites that kind of take over our life through time unless we have another master, and that master is God. And as he becomes our master, then he gives us the power to overcome them as individual people without god people can overcome some of these appetites but i sometimes like to use the illustration of the whack-a-mole you remember you the game you played whack-a-mole you'd whack one mole and then you'd whack another and then in the meantime another one would pop up up here here and there'd be all these moles popping up and you'd get one but another one would pop up and that's kind of the way it is in life when we try to master our own um, appetites and our own sins and our own addictions by ourselves we might be able to get one down and then another one something over here pops up and then we pop that one down and the, the one that we thought we had control over it pops up uh, and that's so as human means we can sometimes gain control over those appetites but when it's the holy spirit and god is our master he helps us to kind of deal with it all the situations he goes to the core of the matter so that's why it's important to um as Christians go to God and acknowledge, hey, 
God, I want to overcome these things, but really I can't do it on my own. Your Holy Spirit has to help you, and he'll guide you in the way to do it as well. Uh, another bit of wisdom to gain from this account of uh, Jacob and Esau and the trading of trading places as uh, Jacob kind of gets the birthright of the oldest and Esau loses it is that gain gaining something through manipulation is really not gaining anything at all. Jacob most likely has heard from his mother. That God, what God told Rebecca from the beginning, that God had chosen to elevate Jacob and that the promises to Abraham, his grandfather, and Isaac, his father, that he'll make him a great nation and, and that, that the, the seed will come through him, the Messiah seed, that that would be passed on through Jacob, him, and not his brother Esau. So he's probably heard this because God told Rebecca, and Rebecca seems to... Um, you know, have a special relationship with him. And it makes sense that she would have told him this. Uh, but Jacob, rather than let God do his work and bless him in his own way and in his own timing, he decides to manipulate situations and people to get what he feels is should be his in the first place. Um, it's a bit of a family generational sin that uh, Jacob has here as we see Rebecca she seems to be a manipulator and her brother Laban we'll we'll see him later he's also a manipulator uh, so it's kind of something that comes naturally to Jacob if you will uh, if you've ever been manipulated by a person you know how frustrating this can be um, just I looked up some definitions of manipulation and this one I kind of the one I like is it fits our situation here. Manipulation is the act of purposely exerting psychological control over an individual for personal gain. It can be gaslighting, passive aggressive behavior, lying and blaming, withdrawal and withholding. That's what Jacob does here. He withholds something that Esau really wants to get what he wants. It can be threats or bullying or isolating someone. Um, trying to, you know, uh, maybe in a family situation, well, we don't talk to that one until they do what we want them to do. Uh, Jacob here withholds what's something that Esau wants to gain what he wants. And that's a manipul manipulative behavior. And in the end, when we gain something this way, when, when the person... Um, gets what they want doing this it really never is a true gain in the end it is a net loss you will lose more than you gain when you manipulate and things that are really probably more important than the things you think you want and you're going to manipulate to get Jacob he ends up losing his home his family his safety um, and yes God gives a measure of that back to him over a long period of time but he, he loses all these things because he's a manipulator and a deceiver. Uh, you have to ask as he's running away from home, afraid for his life, if he thought, I don't know if this was worth it. Because it wasn't, really. And, you know, God could have worked all the things out in his life for the good if he would have just trusted him to bring about the right blessings at the right time instead of trying to steal them from his brother. Um... Jim Elliot, the missionary who, who died uh, at the end of a spear going to travel to take the gospel down in Central America, uh, he said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So in the end, the things that we manipulate others for or people that manipulate us to try to gain, they're, they're simply temporal things, things that uh, won't last uh, you cannot manipulate God into doing anything. Um, so, and he's the one that gives eternal gifts and rewards, right? Um, and so if you think you can manipulate other people in this life, once again, you're going to find that it, it's um, a net loss. You're going to lose more than you gain. So it's a cautionary um, wisdom, a tale here about don't try to manipulate your way, manipulate other people to get what you think you want. Um, as Jacob does here, instead of trusting God, 
he tries to manipulate his brother. Um, another nugget of wisdom here that we can find in uh, this Trading Spaces uh, tale is that God doesn't have to bless you, and he, doesn't, and he really doesn't bless you according to your birth order or any other human metric, any other way that humans use to measure people or who has the inside track or who has uh, the um, the way the earth would say well the world would say look at this person is going to succeed in life this person is going to have what they want in life this person is going to um, be able to enjoy the fruits and benefits of life God doesn't even look at that when he chooses to bless someone or chooses to call someone if Jacob would have trusted God in his word then he would know he didn't need to be the firstborn to receive the blessings of God. That birthright didn't matter. Okay, this, this takes place many times uh, before where it's, I mentioned last week, it's God doesn't say, oh, this person's born first, so this is who I'm going to call and bless. Uh, all the metrics that we as humans use to determine whether a person will be uh, successful in life or lived the blessed life, as we say, they really don't come into account in God's mind at all good looks, uh, being athletic, even getting good grades, or being born in the right family, born in the right nation. Are you talented or smart, or charismatic, or hardworking, or, or even just lucky? In the end, God has given every person some sort of talent and ability. And some we as humans, we don't even recognize them. But God's given us all something as a blessing to be able to serve him and to um, uh, outreach out to others and to um, find blessing in our own lives. Uh, I knew a young man, uh, he's a, a bit younger than me, probably 10 years younger than me, I would guess. His name was Josh. His name is Josh. He's still alive. And Josh uh, has Down syndromes, Down syndrome. And he ended up... Uh, when he graduated from high school, getting a job um, with his mother as the uh, janitorial janitor cleaning our church, where I was at, not here in Thomasville, but at another location. And Josh had this great um, ability to he would give you five whenever you see him, give you a big smile. Some, a lot of times he would give you hugs, and when he started to know you better, and he just also he never worried about you know the things everybody else worried about he was just happy with simple things in life and he was really blessed the world may look at somebody with down syndrome and say oh what are they going to have in life but he had really he had it all i guess in his mind and he ministered to uh, the rest of us at church as he would you know you might be feeling down that day and he would come up and give you five or uh give you a hug and say hey pastor marty and you know it was uh, kind of could make your day so in the end, what may God choose to bless Jacob over Esau is that Esau, he never stops thinking that he is, uh, you know, this great and mighty hunter, strong and amazing man. He can run and he's good with the ladies. He's daddy's favorite. He kind of always just felt this. That he was all that in a bag of chips, as we might say. And at some point later in his life, though, Jacob, who at this point, he's a manipulator, he's a deceiver, but at some point he comes. It started really when he left his home and he had to run away for his life and he, and he meets the Lord. Um, we'll talk about this later and he has the vision. Um, at, at a point, Jacob kind of just surrenders and he gives up and he says, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to be the top dog anymore. I'm just going to let God deal with my life and kind of give it to him and if he chooses to bless, then that's a blessing. If he doesn't, um, I'm just going to be okay with what I've got. And when he does that, it's like God says, Aha! Now we can do something. This is what I saw before you were born, Jacob. And this is why I chose you. Because I knew you would come. You could come to this point. So it's this when Jacob kind of lets God take over. That's when the real trading places takes place. When Jacob becomes the one with the spiritual birthright, as chosen by God to keep the promises of Abraham, he inherits a spiritual heritage. It's way better than getting all of Isaac's sheep and goats and tents. 
which is, you know, what the birthright was about. Instead of that, he had a spiritual heritage, a spiritual inheritance in that God was going to be with him and bless him. And the Messiah would ultimately come from the line of Jacob. Well, the last little bit of wisdom, I think, that we can gain from this uh, account of Jacob and Esau and their um, their struggle with each other. Where, do, well, where does it come from? This, this account's really more than just about Jacob and Esau. Their sibling rivalry, yes, siblings are naturally going to have a little rivalry with each other, especially when they're younger. But this account is also about Isaac and Rebecca, and it really made things worse in that they had favorites. And so that last little bit of wisdom that I want to share with you from this account is that if you have kids, then love them all and do your best to love them the same, equally at least, or with the same place in your heart. Uh, the way we show everybody love is a little different, okay, because the way people express love is different. But we should love them all the same. Um, and this is this is where Jake, uh, Isaac and Rebecca, they really miss the mark here. And it ends up splitting their family in two. I mean, it had devastating accounts. It's not like God can't forgive it, but uh, of course he can. Uh, he, Jesus died for all our sins. But on earth, they, uh, sometimes we pay heavy prices for the things we do. And when, when you play favorites with kids, you're going to uh, often see a lot of division in your family. Uh, you may have a favorite ice cream or a favorite baseball team or a favorite band or a favorite preacher or a favorite music style, maybe a favorite vacation spot. But please don't have a favorite child. I can guarantee it will bite you in the end if you do. It will bite you in your ear, if you will. <laughs> now, I know every family says, oh, this this one, you know, and the kids grow older and they look at one of the siblings and they say, this so-and-so was the favorite in our family and it's hardly ever say oh i was the favorite there are some that do um actually i guess say oh i was the favorite in my family um and most people probably find that annoying when they say that um but uh, uh you know in the end most people don't admit it if they think they were uh, but there are quite a few people that will point out that uh, oh my brother or my sister they were the favorites and you know sometimes it's the kids perceive the wrong thing. Um, parents, parenting style changes from the first to the second to the third. Um, they learn stuff with the first that they, uh, maybe mistakes they made and they hopefully improve with the second and third. Um, they get less uptight as they, they get more kids. Um, sometimes it's just natural. The way they parent boys and girls can be very different. Uh, so there can be some things that are just perception of the kids. But... In many cases, uh, there is actual favoritism. Uh, and it's not only obvious, but it can be in your face, and it can be completely dysfunctional in families and in homes. Um, research suggests that parental favoritism is surprisingly common. And rather than being just a quirk of family life, it can actually be very harmful. Um, some some experts, whatever, estimate that it can be happening to as much as 65% of families. And it's been studied across every culture uh, all across the world. So it's quite wide, widespread. And as widespread as it is, it can damage a children's well-being across their whole lifespan, from their childhood into middle age and beyond. It's considered such an important factor in this range of emotional problems that psychologists have named it, and they've come up with an acronym for it, PDT, Parental Differential Treatment. So if you grew up in that sort of home, uh, where your parents had someone else besides you as the favorite, or at least that's your perception, um, the good news is, is that God is again a source for overcoming such hurt. Um, you don't have to... Um, uh, let that destroy you. Nothing in life, God doesn't want anything in life to destroy you. He wants to help you overcome that. You know, you can't change how you grew up. You can't change your, you know, your past. But you can, with God's help, change your future. And that sometimes starts with forgiveness and then moving on and asking God to help you not repeat that same process if you have children yourself. So, 
that is a that's the good news yeah you know um yeah there was dysfunction there with isaac and rebecca but the good news is is that uh, jacob was mo able to move beyond that uh, he probably you know he had some dysfunction in his own family for sure but he didn't it didn't destroy him uh and really i don't know that it didn't destroy esau either he too became the father of a great nation and that's simply because of the grace of god and goes forth in our lives uh, even when people let us down so i uh, hope that that this um little bit of wisdom from the tale of not the tale it's a real account because you know it's it happens really this sort of thing has happened multiple countless multiple times over history uh, probably in all of, everybody's life has experienced something similar to this whether it be family or outside of the family but there's wisdom to be gleaned so how we handle these situations that might happen to us in life let me pray for you lord i thank you lord jesus uh, for your wisdom your wisdom is so much greater than ours and we just want to submit to it in our lives right now acknowledging that um, you are the source of all wisdom and you are the source if we listen to you and we trust in you and we wait for you to work and to speak and we and we research your word and live accordingly lord god that there's wisdom be found there that can bring life and bring blessings rivers of blessing into our life so lord i just pray for your wisdom over your people as they hear this today in your name amen and amen god bless you and for those watching after or before the fourth happy independence day and uh, enjoy the time tomorrow and uh, we will be back here sunday morning with our normal uh, service god bless